Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, apologize for last week, but we had a little uh, bit of Mother Nature that decided it was going to um, pose a problem for us with our weather. Uh, let me know if you guys uh, have any trouble hearing me. I presume you can hear me. Uh, but anyway, today, what we're going to do, since we didn't really have time to scan in uh, unknown slides because we were closed all last week for the first time in the history of the laboratory going back to 1972. Um, we uh, got a lecture to give and I, actually this is timely because uh, next month uh, there's going to be a board immersion uh, course for I think it's maybe next month or April for uh, preparing uh, for the dermatology the, the derm boards that'll be coming up in the in the summer and so we do this Dr. Regal uh, and C. Lee and some others, myself, have, have been involved in a course we started about a year, two years ago. And uh, I'm going to be giving this talk plus another talk on neoplastic disorders. Um, those talks are 15 minutes. I'm going to go over longer uh, today. And I've, I've put some slides that are hidden in that lecture um, that are not hidden in this talk. So you'll get a little extra information. But basically, this is sort of designed to give you uh, information about the, the boards and and, uh, and inflammatory things. So just basically, when you're thinking about the dermatopathology part uh, of the board examination, these small two, 15, 20 minute talks are not enough. I mean, you need to study far more than that. You need to, you need to know a lot more uh, than just some overview. So it's a significant part of the exam as well. If you don't pass the derm path part, you're not going to pass the overall exam. Uh, I've known people over the years that did great on the science, on the written part and, and the minutiae and all that kind of stuff, but they just weren't good at derm path and they couldn't pass the exam. So you, you have to really know your derm path. Um, and presumably if you're third year right now, you've been studying this all along and it shouldn't be new to you. So a lot of this stuff I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about this morning should be pretty much review for you. For the guys that are the second and first years, obviously, you're going to be learning some new stuff. But for third years, um, by now, you should know every single thing I'm talking about here and just say, yes, I know that. Yes, and confirms that. Or, okay, well, I know that a little bit better now. But you should know all of these general principles uh, quite well by the time you're a third year resident and how to recognize them. Uh, on the exam, the, the uh, slides, the examples you're going to be looking at are going to be classic cases. They're not going to be weird stuff that you have any trouble, uh, you know, figuring out what's going on. They're going to be classic examples. I used to actually uh, be on the board test writing committee and we used to uh, throw out uh, cases and things like that that weren't classic. So uh, they throw them to the either the research or to the to the in-service exam, but the actual board exam they want those to be classic, non-controversial questions. They don't want to have anybody uh, file any lawsuit against them, saying that these are not good questions. And they have had lawsuits filed in them in the past, so they don't want that. They want it to be something that's a good test of information and, and whatnot. So you have to have good knowledge, uh, like I mentioned before. You, have, you do have to know how to differentiate the differential diagnostic entities, so they're not going to make it, everything easy. Uh, so you realize that. But there's, but you don't have to know a lot of esoteric stuff. You know, you don't have to know the really bizarre, crazy stains. They're not going to expect you to know all the stains for every lymphoma out there. But you do need to know the special stains for fungus, for calcium, uh, melanocytic lesions, mast cells. Uh, etc. So you need to know those and you need to know your infectious diseases as well. So again, don't worry about esoteric, don't worry about rare soft tissue neoplasms. They might have an occasional, you know, soft, they might have a soft tissue neoplasm or two on there, probably AFX or DFSP, but they're not going to ask you, you know, some of these weird things that we look at in, in dermatopathology conferences and stuff like that. That's not going to be on there. Uh, rare, rare fish results, rare genetic results, rarely used stains, and impossible diagnoses, even for thoughts, they're, they're not going to be on there. So it's, it's a fair test. Okay, so let's start off talking about some infectious agents, and the boards love these because they're pathognomonic. 
uh, and they can test multiple levels of knowledge on these. So, so you got to know this stuff just like the back of your hand. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't shrink on this. So, uh, herpes simplex infection again. Uh, you need to know what these look like, and you know what the, the deem sustain, the smear, the multinucleated giant cells with the margination, the chromatin that you see there, uh, the clinical, the herpetic clustered vesicles often on erythematous base, definitely. And then if you get a biopsy of this, you're gonna see the acanthalytic cells with the viral cytopathic effect floating freely in the blister space like you see here. Notice the, the multinucleated cells here, the margination of the chromatin. That means that the chromatin is sort of pushed at the margin of the nucleus there. So that's what we, we mean when we talk about that. Um, I doubt if they're going to ask you Cowdery A, Cowdery B, that's a little bit esoteric and we're not really using that too much uh, anymore today. They might ask you if you can use an immunofluorescence uh, study to uh, determine this. And the answer is yes, there are monoclonal antibodies that have been de uh, developed against herpes virus infection. So uh, actually you can do that. But herpes simplex and, and varicella and zoster histologically all work the same. So they're not going to really ask you to distinguish those. Cytomegalovirus, they actually had this on my board examination way back in the day. And uh, so they actually could ask you something here. Uh, basically here you've got, uh, this was an HIV positive patient that uh, had these perianal ulcers that were due to a CMV. And here you get the uh, large eosinophilic inclusions with a clear halo giving you kind of the owl's eye appearance. These are some uh, CMV infected cells down here. You'll see a little higher magnification. So here's the, the inclusion and uh, they talk about that kind of looking like an owl's eye, if you will. So here's the cell. These are also inclusions here, but that's the, the nuclear cytoplasmic and nuclear inclusions with cytomegalovirus. So that could be asked. And here's another example. Um, these tend to uh, infect non-epithelial cells. They can infect epithelial cells, but rarely. Herpes virus infection, always epithelial cells, CMV, fibroblasts and endothelial cells more commonly. So look inside the blood vessels like you see here, and there's the uh, little owl's eye inclusion. And then these are the small little granular uh, intracytoplasmic inclusions of cytomegalovirus. Hand, foot, and mouth, Coxsackie virus uh, caused by A5, 9, and 16. So they're going to expect you to know that. Uh, clinically, you get these nice lancet-shaped acral vesicles like you see here like football or, or lancet cells. And all of the viral infections, the DNA viruses especially, tend to cause ballooning degeneration of keratinocytes. So you have ballooning degeneration. Uh, that's, that's characteristic of, of those types of viruses. Now the RNA viruses like measles and things like that, they actually sometimes don't even involve the epithelium much. They can just kind of give you a superficial perivascular dermatitis. Um, COVID, they might ask you some questions about that now. We just had a nice uh, talk on that last night from Esther Freeman. Uh, but I would recommend that you uh, learn about COVID cutaneous manifestations also. Anything that's acute, um, current, the boards like to ask questions about it. So they expect you to be current about things. And you can get the, you know, the COVID toe uh, gives you a perneal-like morphology. Uh, and you can actually see virus particles inside endothelial cells with electromicroscopy. Uh, in some of those cases, it's been reported. It's a little bit controversial, but uh, has been reported. So you should know that. And then, of course, you can get uh, things like the thrombotic vasculopathy with COVID, and, and there's a number of different other cutaneous manifestations. So I'd recommend that you learn those as well. Um, but if you look at this disease, you see this uh, characteristic ballooning degeneration of the epidermis. It's often seen on acral skin, like you see here. And so these cells all have a ballooned morphology. That's where you get the cells fill with fluid and you actually can get these pink inclusion bodies up here as well. So it's analogous to what we just saw with the CMV. It's not CMV, it looks different than CMV, but these little pink inclusions are the viral particles inside the keratinocytes. And these are similar, not quite as dramatic, not quite as much ballooning as you see with the pox virus infections, uh, parapox virus infections, or if Milker's nodule. So, but this is in the same family, same idea, intracellular uh, ballooning degeneration with inclusions in the Coxsackie viruses. So again, these are some other viruses to know. Uh, HPV gives you coilocytic change. We just mentioned the other pox virus infections, marked ballooning, extensive inflammation, and then uh, molluscum, 
they had that on my exam also, by the way. I, I thought, I think that the first slide they showed us years ago, and, and some of these things are, are, you know, they're life changing experiences taking the board examination, so you kind of never forget it. The first slide they showed us was hibernoma. I said, well, okay, cool. This is going to be an interesting uh, exam. And then the second one was mollusca. And I felt like, well, why are you insulting my intelligence? I spent hours and hours, many hours studying for this exam. And you show me a molluscan contagiosum that a high school student could get. But anyway, just remember, uh, they might show you something as easy as molluscum. Uh, the Kaposi sarcoma, again, know that that's caused by HHV8. So just make sure that you know that. Okay, tinea nigra, uh, clinically, these often look like melanoma. So they might show you something like this and it might put um, malignant melanoma down as a difference of diagnosis. Uh, this is caused by a dermatiaceous fungal infection. Uh, the same kinds of organisms that uh, cause chromoblastomycosis and phaohyphomycosis. These are all the dermatiaceous fungi. They're not going to ask you a lot of questions on this, so don't you know try to become a mycologist before the exam. But uh, just I would know generally about this. Uh, Bonnie Lusky is a mycologist, and and she's actually. Um, submits questions and things. So she might have, you might get a question or two about mycology. When you biopsy tinea nigra, there's really no inflammation. The most important thing is that clinicians really think this is malignant melanoma. And you start looking in the cornified layer and you see these pigmented hyphae like this here. So that's tinea nigra in that situation. And if you culture these, they give you these dark brown colonies and under the microscope, you get these little spores that are pigmented like you see here. Blastomycosis, you probably will get some questions about some of the deep fungal infections, and you should know these. These are important. Uh, they're life-threatening, and so you want to make sure that you can recognize them clinically and histologically. Clinically, they can be kind of nondescript, especially if patients are immunocompromised. They can get these nondescript papules. Uh, when you look at these under the microscope, you get a classic suppurative granulomatous dermatitis with pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia, and blastomycosis gives you these broad-based budding yeasts uh, that's classic. So we, the best place to look for the organisms is look inside the histiocytes and look in the separative areas. So those are the two best places to look for the microorganisms. So here's an example, classic histologic finding. So if you see this, the first thing you should think about is an infectious disease when you get separative granulomatous dermatitis with epithelial hyperplasia here. And then you start looking for the organisms. Here's an area of separation. And yes, right here is a yeast. It's got the uh, refractile wall around it. And uh, you do special stains, PAS, GMS, and you can see the broad-based budding yeast here of blastomycosis. So, so recognize that. Uh, here's another example demonstrating these broad-based budding yeast in, in blastomycosis. And here's the organism in culture, white kind of uh, cerebriform colony, and there's a nice example of the broad base. But now histo can also uh, give you, it's, it's another one of the uh, examples of the um, deep mycotic infections, but these, these are the intracellular microorganism differential diagnosis, a little different than blasto, but you need to know what these other intracellular parasitic infectious diseases look like under the microscope. So you get this uh, histologically, you get a relatively diffuse infiltrate with histiocytes and neutrophils. You usually get less pseudoepitheliomus hyperplasia here. So um, the, they asked us a question one year, like I think uh, what, which, I think this is an in-service exam, which uh, infectious disease gives you the most pseudocarcinomus hyperplasia? And they asked this, they asked crypto, they asked coxy, then they asked blasto. The right answer is blasto that almost always gives you uh, pseudocarcinomus hyperplasia. You know, it, uh, it probably wouldn't really be fair to put, put coxy in there, but blasto is, is the one that most commonly of the deep fungal infections will give you the pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. And so if you look at this, actually, interestingly enough, can simulate leukocytoclastic vasculitis. The other intracellular organisms that you need to know about, rhinoscleroma, which is caused by Klebsiella, uh, leishmaniasis, obviously caused by a parasite, and then penicilliosis, penicillium marnefii, those also can give you intracellular parasitization of the, the histiocytes. And then uh, um, granuloma inguinale, uh, that also can do it. So you need to know those various organisms that can, can cause that. So this was an example of uh, 
histoplasmosis. And again, notice it doesn't have all the pseudoepithelialomous hyperplasia. It's got more of a diffuse infiltrate and you get all these little breakdown products of neutrophils and then admixed within those are organisms of, the, uh, of histo. So it can simulate leukocytoclastic vasculitis. These are the organisms right here, these little tiny particles and they can look a lot like nuclear dust particles of vasculitis. And you can actually get neutrophils with breakdown products of neutrophils in the infiltrate as well. So it can look a lot like LCV, but it's not LCV. So that's something to remember when you're dealing with histo. Histo also is an encapsulated organism. It has a capsule. And if you look carefully, you can see that capsule here. These organisms are very small. Uh, they're way smaller than blasto. They're smaller than uh, than crypto, and uh, the amount of capsular material is, is limited, minimal compared to what you see in cryptococcosis, where you get this large amount of mucogelatinous capsule, especially in the mucogelatinous form of, of cryptococcosis. So these are some of the other uh, opportunistic fungal infections. Again, this is in a comprehensive uh, infectious disease lecture. This is just looking at all the, uh, the family, if you will, of the uh, opportunistic of, of uh, inflammatory skin diseases. And these are some of the other opportunistic fungi that you have to know about. Uh, things like mucor, rhizopus, alternaria, aspergillus. And uh, these are important life-threatening things. So you need to know about those as well. Zygomycosis, uh, mucorales, rhizopus, absidi, the most common causes. These give you these large aseptate hyphae. Um, and sometimes they can have these sort of septa-like structures which can cause confusion. These may actually have a relatively minimal amount of inflammation. Uh, sometimes these get into the subcutaneous fat and looks almost just almost like nothing in there, interestingly enough. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. These people are usually severely immunocompromised. This is a classic biopsy of one of these and usually gives you epidermal necrosis, degeneration of collagen. Uh, these fungi just kind of grow diffusely throughout the skin and they usually don't in, in, uh, give a very dense inflammatory infiltrate and um, can give you this pattern like you see here. So we don't really see any organisms here, but if you look up in the, uh, with the PAS stain, there's all these large aseptate hyphae. They look like these straws up in here. And usually because these people are immunocompromised, they give you lots of organisms with relatively minimal amount of inflammation. So these don't normally live in the skin. These aren't normally pathogens like blasto is or coxy or crypto, those kind of things are are normal, you know, normal human pathogens. These are bread mold. And so when the individual is immunocompromised, these organisms just grow and they consequently don't usually incite a very significant brisk inflammatory uh, infiltrate. Here's an example of one of these. Notice it's got the uh, nice example of sporangia at the top with all the little spores. And then you get the, uh, the little aseptate hyphae with these almost look like roots. So these are like little, you know, forming kind of like mushrooms, <laughs> if you will. Uh, in, in the person when they get this. And, and these usually grow quite quickly, like a day or two, like bread mold. So these are some of the other fungi you have to know. Uh, highly recommend spending some time with this and uh, make sure you know all of these because they could any, any and all of these are fair game on the board examination. Very likely to get some questions about those. Um, secondary syphilis, you're also likely to get some questions about this. Um, these are um, again, uh, we're in a, a, an, an epidemic of syphilis, if you will. It's resurging now, and uh, it's got a lot of different clinical manifestations, the classic widespread papulosquamous eruption, like you see in the left image here. But then the palmar plantar involvement with the ham-colored papules with the central uh, area of scale crust, kind of cholerates of scale, that's classic for syphilis. So when you see an image like this, uh, that's pretty much syphilis until, until proven otherwise. Uh, if you look at the biopsy of syphilis, it tends to give you a lot of different patterns, but the most common is superficial and deep psoriasis from the with plasma cells with poorly formed granulomas. And the best stain is an immunoperoxidase stain directed to T pallidum. So here's an example of a syphilis biopsy with a fairly dense inflammatory infiltrate. One of the things that is fairly true about syphilis is that it almost always does have plasma cells in the infiltrate. It's rare to see syphilis with no plasma cells. You can get relatively few plasma cells, but almost never no plasma cells. And this is the infiltrate, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, immunoperoxidase stain demonstrating the nice brown spirochetes there with the immunoperoxidase um, stain. Hansen's disease, uh, very likely to get a question or two about this. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know that you need to be a Hansen's disease expert. Uh, it's a pretty complicated immunopathologic and, and immunologic disease, but basically uh, think of it in terms of a disease that goes from lots of organisms when you have relatively low immunity to few organisms when you have a lot of immunity. And when you get tuberculoid leprosy, it tends to give a sarcoidal granulomatous infiltrate histologically. So it's kind of the opposite of what you would think. You'd say, well, tuberculoid uh, leprosy ought to give you tuberculoid granulomas, but no, it gives you sarcoidal granulomas that tend to be elongated and tend to follow neurovascular bundles. Lepromatous leprosy tends to give you a xanthomatous diffuse infiltrate. And then there's some other forms as well. The indeterminate form gives a very sparse perivascular and perineural lymphocytic infiltrate, usually with a negative fight stain. Sometimes you might see one or two organisms. Tuberculoid disease, very hard to see organisms there. Uh, and the lepromatous type, you see a lot. And then of course, there's the borderline types where you get features of, of both of them in the same specimen and clinically as well. So these are some examples of clinically there. And this is an example of a uh, lepromatous leprosy. You can see at low magnification, it's got this pale foamy cytoplasm, with many of these histiocytes with some lymphocytic infiltrate, higher magnification. A fight stain here is gonna be strongly positive. So this is going to be multi-bacillary disease. These patients have a high bacterial load and they are prone to get reactions uh, when you start treatment with these patients. So you have to make sure these are the kind of patients need to be on thalidomide, uh, they need to be on things that are going to prevent them from getting severe neurologic reactions when you start treating them. And they can also get erythema nodosum leprosum. Other mycobacterial infections, uh, things like M. canzasii, M. ulcerans, um, these were seen very commonly in patients with HIV infection. A few years ago, we had patients that were getting this from nail salons, where uh, nail salons were not keeping the water baths uh, sterilized and women would go in and get manicures, pedicures, and they were getting these atypical mycobacterial infections. If you look at this uh, clinically, they give you these ulcerated areas that often tend to spread proximally in a lymphangetic form and a sporotrichoid form. And this is one of the diseases that give you sporotrichoid spread. If you look under the microscope, it tends to be a separative granulomatous infiltrate or sometimes just purely separative inflammatory infiltrate. And it may have very few organisms or may have quite a few depending on, on the state of the host. So this was an example uh, of an atypical mycobacterial infection. Notice this, uh, in this case, demonstrated mostly a paniculitis. It's got a granulomatous infiltrate again. These are all histiocytes with some lymphocytes. And if you stain this, you might be lucky to see some organisms, but in some cases you may just see like one or two or a small cluster of them like you see here. So you have to do cultures in these patients to make a definitive diagnosis many of the time. The statistics are that looking for infectious agents, AFB, in some cases, deep fungal organisms as well, like in Sporo, 40 to 50% sensitivity. So cultures, PCR, special stains, uh, special stains not as good as, as cultures and PCR. And sometimes you have to do multiple cultures to get a definitive diagnosis. Bolts of a tigo, caused by bacteria. This gives a subcorneal vesicle with neutrophils, uh, acantholytic keratinocytes. Usually more of these, and in staffs called it skin syndrome, which is associated with a circulating uh, epidermolytic toxin. Here you usually will see some bacteria in the blister space, and it often gives you neutrophils, a spongiform pustule, and a tissue gram stain may demonstrate bacteria. It doesn't always but often does. And this is a classic example, a subcorneal, very superficial blister, often with neutrophils in the blister space like you see here. So the differential diagnosis of this includes superficial pemphigus. Usually you don't get as many acantholytic cells in bullus batigo as you do with superficial pemphigus, but you do get the neutrophils in the space here, very classic. And then obviously you think about other things such as a fungal infection like dermatophyte infection can give you this as well. But this is a classic pattern what you see in bullets with tygo. And then if you do a gram stain, brown bren tissue gram stain, in many cases, you'll actually see the clusters of bacteria that are gram positive in this case. And this is caused by staphylococcus. These can be caused by both methicillin resistant staph or methicillin sensitive staph. Erythrasma caused by Carinibacterium, and this is a gram-positive cocobacillus. It gives you the coral red fluorescence when you take a woods lamp, as you can see in this image over here. 
and this is due to porphyrins that are produced by the bacteria. And if you look at this under the microscope, it shows the filamentous bacteria growing at right angles to the surface of the cornified layer. This is very similar to what you see in juvenile plantar uh, dermatosis, and it's the same kind of bacteria that cause other carini bacterial infections. So it basically, the, they all histologically look very similar. And you can see these are bacteria here that are in the uppermost layer of the stratum corneum. And if you look carefully, you can see they're kind of diving into the stratum corneum at right angles, sort of analogous to the way candida grows in the skin. And here's a gram stain demonstrating that. So other bacterial infections to know, uh, again, other staphylococcal organisms that we can see like uh, botryomycosis, for example, where you see grains, bacillary angiomatosis, cat scratch disease. They might ask a question about that caused by Bartonella. And then of course, staph scalded skin syndrome. So let's talk a little bit about parasites. Uh, I'd be very surprised if you didn't get at least one question about scabies. Uh, might get a question about Norwegian or crusted scabies. Uh, if you uh, do a scraping, uh, you see the female mite, you might see eggs, you might see sibilla break, this is the fecal material of the schematic mite. Normally you'll see about five to 10 mites in an infestation, but in a patient with crusted scabies, you may get up to a million mites. And uh, if you get a biopsy of scabies, here you see the organism in the cornified layer up here, uh, got a little nice burrow there. And the histology shows usually a superficial and deep wedge-shaped infiltrate of lymphocytes with the bun and eosinophils. And you can see lots of eosinophils in this image here. And there's the mite higher magnification. Some other uh, less common parasitic conditions, cutaneous myiasis. They like to ask a question or two about these esoteric things. So you might get a question about this. This is caused by dermatobia hominis, which is specific for uh, humans called hominis. And what you see under the microscope is a central cavity that contains the fly larva. These larvae have these little uh, rings of these black spicules here. That's very characteristic for this specific uh, cause of myiasis. And the way this thing works is you have a fly that actually has the eggs uh, that it uh, has got on its abdomen. It comes and bites you lays the egg on your skin. And these are really tiny little eggs, much smaller than this. And then you scratch the area and it implants it in your skin. So that's actually how these infections get transmitted. And this is uh, what it looks like under the microscope. So here's the, the larva uh, cross sections. You can see the insect flight muscle here and the little black spicule right here that's seen clinically that grossly those little rings there. So that's myiasis. Tunga penetrans is seen on acral skin, and it's a flea type organism. It's not like the kind of fleas that dogs get. It's a little different. This one actually embeds in your skin. It's called a sand flea, and it looks a little like a flea when you see it grossly. And it's a, gravi a gravid female flea and tunnels, makes a little hole, and then uh, basically the it kind of breathe through that little hole. And uh, so when you look under the microscope, here's the actual organism seen uh, grossly. And this is what it is when it's in your skin. And here's the little tunnel to the surface. And so that's how it lives and it grows and it, it leaves your skin and, and gets in the sand and then comes in and bur burrows into the next person that walks by. So here's another example showing where that little organism lives. This is actually, this would develop somebody underneath somebody's nail. So this is tongue of penetrans once again. Okay, so other parasites to know. Uh, leash mania, again, make sure you know that. Uh, other non scabetic mites, food mites, dust mites, avian mites might ask you about that. Uh, hookworm, pinworm, the tick-borne diseases, especially Lyme disease, strongly recommend that you learn about Lyme disease. Uh, and now the new, newly described Starry syndrome, which is also probably caused by a Borrelia organism, but has not actually been identified yet. And then uh, I know a little bit about some of the non-parasitic uh, harmful organisms, things like brown recluse, black widow, centipede, millipede, Chagas disease. They ask a few questions about those. So these are, quote, gimme questions, if you will. You can learn these pretty easily, know them, study them, and uh, you'll be able to get the questions fairly readily because they're, they're straightforward and, and it, there's no, no real controversy about those. So you may as well get those questions. And then uh, when you get the very difficult uh, gene questions or very tough, uh, maybe a tough dermatopathology slide, uh, at least you'll have these to kind of back up on and, you, and, and help your, your score out.
So let's move on and talk about some connective tissue diseases. Uh, you're definitely going to get questions about this. Uh, lupus erythematosus, they're, you know, this is our disease in dermatology and in rheumatology, so they're going to, to expect you to know uh, everything there is to know about lupus. So you need to know the clinical, you need to know the various uh, clinical manifestations, discoid LE, acute LE, subacute LE. You need to know the serology. Uh, you need to know now about dermatomyositis in detail with all the new antibodies and the new uh, MD5 associated dermatomyositis. So you need to know all these things about connective tissue diseases. Strongly recommend that you really study this very hard and, and in detail. And the histology is characteristic as well. The histology of uh, acute LE, subacute LE, and dermatomyositis is very similar. It gives you an interface dermatitis with a lymphocytic infiltrate with macular alteration. You usually get more thickening in the basement membrane zone with lupus, especially discoid LE, than you do with um, dermatomyositis, but they can look very similar. So they're probably not going to ask you to distinguish between those diseases under the microscope, but they might show you a clinical picture of someone like this and then show you histology. And they might say, is this more likely to be dermatomyositis or lupus? And and this image here, which is a classic example of subacute LE, they would expect you to be able to tell those apart. Um, the, his, the immunofluorescence, if it's positive, it should give you diffuse coarse grain and deposition of all the immunoreactants at the dermothermal junction. And this is a nice example of lupus, superficial deep infiltrative lymphocytes. It's got some involvement around the follicle and probably got, it's got some thickening of the base membrane zone here. This is a markedly thickened base membrane uh, zone here. So this would be an example of someone with discoid lupus erythematosus. Uh, this isn't a plugged follicle, but you commonly see plugged follicles. And if you do immunofluorescence on this and it's positive, in many cases, unfortunately, it's negative and it should be positive. You get the diffuse coarse granular deposits of all of the immunoreactants like you see here at the dermal junction. This was IgG in this case. The sclerosing disorders, morphia, scleroderma, crest, <clears throat> strongly recommend learning about these two. Uh, these all have the classic reaction pattern of sclerosis of the collagen in the dermis. They can all look histologically the same. So you really need clinical correlation to tell which of these diseases you're dealing with. And sclerosis histologically is thickening and homogenization of the collagen bundles with a decrease in the number of fibroblasts. Fibrosis is an increase in the number of fibroblasts. So you need to make sure you know what sclerosis is. And here's a beautiful example of morphia or scleroderma. Notice this, this sclerotic collagen, homogenized collagen bundles, few fibroblasts, if any, and these lymphoplasmacytic aggregates, which are commonly seen there. So that's in morphia or scleroderma. And you can't really tell these apart once again. They all look the same under the microscope. So you have to have clinical correlation uh, to tell which of these various diseases you're dealing with. Nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy. This is a relatively newly described disease and, and dermatologists were involved in the description of these and, and describing the cause of the disease, which is gadolinium uh, that deposits in the skin. And then it causes a fibrotic reaction. It gives you these, these somewhat amoeboid uh, rippled pattern to the sclerotic changes in the skin, as you can see here. And if you look at this under the microscope, you get this diffuse proliferation of these fibroblasts in the dermis. And you may see calcinosis of these with these so-called lollipop-like structures like you see here. And if you look carefully at those cells, I'll show you that in a minute. So here's the increase in the number of fibroblasts here diffusely in the dermis. And these are positive with VVG. But if you look very carefully inside these, these fibers, and many of them are elastic fibers, you can see a dusky light particulate golden brown deposit, and that's the gadolinium that is deposited on these elastic fibers. And they give you these interesting little lollipop-like structures that form as a reaction to the gadolinium. So this, you should know this disease, know these features, and know the cause of it. And these are usually with people that have renal failure and have undergone magnetic re resonance angiography, usually not MRI, but MRA. And those will give it relatively high concentration of this gadolinium. And it's usually people that can't clear the gadolinium because they have renal failure. Okay, leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Uh, you need to know everything there is to know about this too and realize that, that there's a lot of different classifications of vasculitis. You can get small vessel, medium-sized vessel, large vessel vasculitis. You can get granulomatous vasculitis. You can get thrombotic vasculitis. Um, LCV, leukocytoclastic vasculitis. If you look at it really early, 
you just see a sparse infiltrate of neutrophils and nuclear dust with or without fibrin when you get it really, really early. Uh, but later on, you can see obviously fibrin deposited within the blood vessel walls, thrombosis with a mixed infiltrate of neutrophils, eosinophils, and leukocytoclasia. And this is the classic palpable purpura. So when you see palpable purpura, you obviously need to think about this diagnosis. And not everything that's palpable purpura is vasculitis. You can get um, you know, per, uh, per, per, per dermatitis, you can get scurvy, you can get uh, chronic solar purpura. So everything that's palpable purpura is not LCD, but certainly you should think you see these, this pattern here, you should definitely think about the diagnosis. And here's what it looks like under the microscope, these uh, areas where there's inflammation targeting the blood vessels. Uh, low, you can see all these stratified erythrocytes at low magnification. If you go to higher magnification, you can see uh, fibrin in the wall, of these blood vessels and thrombosis of the lumen with the neutrophils and the nuclear dust here. So this is a classic histologic pattern of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. If you do immunofluorescence of this within usually the first 24 to 48 hours, you can still see deposit of IG, IgA, especially in henoch line purpura. Uh, you can see IgG, IgM, C3, fibrinogen, and fibrin. So you will see that if you, if you get it early enough, but if you get it too early, you may not see it. If you get it too late, you may not see it because it's broken down and, and been degraded. So you kind of have to hit it in that window of time or the immunofluorescence may be artifactually negative. Another example of a blood vessel with lots of fibrin uh, in the wall of the blood vessel here. So that's fibrin, that pinkish material is what you're looking for in leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Calciphylaxis, basically a metabolic condition where you get dystrophic calcification, calcium deposits in the blood vessels and you get thrombosis of blood vessels with a secondary uh, infarct of the skin often associated with protein S, protein C deficiency. You can get a lobular paniculitis with vascular thrombosis. Sometimes you get a real early lesion. You may just see tiny areas of, of calcification, may be difficult to see. The skin breaks down, they get secondary infections. Patients often die from this condition. They don't have to die, but they often do die. And uh, one of the treatments is to use sodium thiosulfate, which sometimes works. Um, it's not great, but sometimes does work. And here's the histology. You see all the calcification within the soft tissue, within blood vessels, and then the total overlying eschar. This is, this is necrotic degenerated collagen up here. The epidermis is necrotic. And here you see the calcification of the blood vessels. So this is what causes all that ischemia with the secondary necrosis. And you may or may not see fibrin in those vessels too. Sometimes you just see the calcification. Sometimes you'll see some fibrin along with that. Erythemal deformity, uh, you should obviously know the clinical features of this, uh, know the causes of erythemal deformity, know the relatively newly described MERM, the mycoplasma associated uh, form of erythemal deformity. That's a disease that has been sort of split apart from classic EM. I'm more of a lumper than a splitter and don't really believe there's a lot of difference between those two conditions, but you should know that at least it's, it's been described. And if you look at sort of the microscope, it's an interface dermatitis. If you get it early, you get a basket weave cornified layer because the inflammation comes in so quickly and causes the changes there that it doesn't even have a chance to form parakeratosis yet. And you get individually necrotic keratinocytes that over the course of time, you get confluent epidermal necrosis. And if this gets really bad, you can get Stevens-Johnson syndrome and involved in mucous membranes. You can get toxic epidermal necrolysis. And if you get it really early, it, it can be subtle. It can simulate a spongiotic dermatitis. So just remember that. So this is an early lesion of erythemal deformity, interface dermatitis and uh, some spongiosis, but notice the epidermal necrosis here as well, the individual necrotic keratinocytes with the basket weave cornified layers. So this is a beautiful example of an early evolving lesion of erythemal deformity. The palisaded granulomatous dermatitides. You need to know these as well. Uh, the three classic ones, granulomanulary, rheumatoid nodule, and necrobiosis lipoidica. Uh, this is a classic example of granulomanulary, the granulomatous lesion near the central clearing, the kind of ring-like pattern to this. Uh, if you look at this under the microscope, you see what's called the, the typical palisaded granulomas with the central mucin deposited and histiocytes palisaded around the mucin. And here you see an example of that uh, in this case. This is more of, a, of almost kind of a pseudo-rheumatoid nodule form. You've got a little bit of generated collagen in this case, but you do have some mucin in the center of that palisade. Necrobiasis lipoidica. Again, this tends to give more of a layered histology with the palisaded granulomatous dermatitis with sclerotic collagen. Classic clinical appearance of these yellowish 
waxy looking lesions on the anterior tibial surface of an individual that's got diabetes. And this uh, lesion tends to get some plasma cells that infiltrate. Beautiful example. Notice you get the sclerotic collagen, the plasma cells, and then the histiocytes here arranged kind of in a layered cake. So this lesion will give you degenerated collagen in the center of the palisade. And then the last one of these that you really need to know about is rheumatoid nodule, some plasma cells. And that gives more fibrin in the center of the palisade. So those are the three main ones that you have to know about. There are others, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma, which is associated with an underlying paraproteinemia, get a lot of cholesterol clefts in that situation. Interstitial granuloma stomatitis with connective tissue disease tends to give more neutrophils and collagen degeneration. You can get gout surrounded by granulomas inflammation. And then other things that you can get uh, granulomas, it looks like a palisaded granuloma stomatitis. People that get filler injections with exogenous collagen that tends to give you a palisaded granulomas inflammation around the collagen. The collagen tends to be more eosinophilic than normal dermal collagen. And the last one I'll just mention is epithelioid sarcoma, which gives you a pseudo palisaded granuloma because this is really a neoplasm that undergoes necrosis and gives you a periphery of the residual neoplastic cells there. Those cells, if you look carefully, they're epithelioid, but they're atypical and you may get mitotic figures in those. The blistering diseases. Okay, you're going to get this. <laughs> Take it to the bank. Everything there is to know about immunofluorescence you need to know about. You need to know about the basal membrane zone in detail. Uh, there are people that make full careers like Dr. Kim Yancey at our institution that's dealt with blistering diseases his entire career. So uh, these guys have a, a vested interest in you knowing everything there is to know about these. So make sure that you know all of these uh, diseases in detail. Uh, so these, these subepidermal blistering diseases, the classic one, obviously, bullous pemphigoid. Um, if you uh, look at this under the microscope early on, you'll see a band-like infiltrate of lymphocytes with eosinophils in there. Uh, fully developed lesions, you get the subabnormal blister with eosinophils. So here's a classic example of bullous pemphigoid, lymphocytes, eosinophils, subabnormal blister. Usually no epidermal necrosis overlying this. And if you do immunofluorescence, you're going to see a positive linear deposition of IgG and C3 in a very high percentage of cases. Now, it's not 100% of cases. So we see some patients that are older, uh, they just don't make a lot of antibody and their immunofluorescence patterns are negative, but the histology is classic. So just realize that you may in about five to 10% of cases get artifactually negative results. Those can usually be detected if you do indirect immunofluorescence findings or if you do salt split skin findings and then do uh, direct immunofluorescence following that. That actually can be uh, can increase that sensitivity even higher, but it's pretty sensitive anyway. So just realize that, that it's a, a good test for uh, immunofluorescence in that case. Uh, Pemphigus vulgaris, associated with myasthenia gravis, thymoma, certain lymphomas, rarely with lupus erythematosus, often seen in Ashkenazi Jewish men. Uh, here you see it's an intraepidermal acantholytic process. So this is an intraepidermal as opposed to subepidermal blister. So a biopsy of this is going to show acantholysis, usually occurring just above the basal cell layer. It also extends down into hair follicles, as opposed to like the Pemphigus vulgaris subtype of Grover's disease, which does not involve the adnexal structures. And this often involves mucous membrane, the conjunctiva of the gentleman's eye, the uh, perianal area is a very common site of involvement. This is a classic example of the histology of Pemphigus vulgaris. This gives you a positive Nikolsky sign. Notice the acantholysis occurring just above the basal cell layer, the so-called row of tombstones that you see here. And you'll often see these acantholytic cells floating freely in the blister space. Notice there's no viral cytopathic effect here like you see with herpes virus infections. This is Pemphigus vulgaris. This is the immunofluorescence. It gives you that chicken wire intercellular binding of IgG and C3, very classic for Pemphigus vulgaris. And then the disorders with the acantholytic dyskeratosis. This is a reaction pattern that you can see with about six or seven diseases is listed here. I won't read them all off for you, but you need to know about these. When you look at this under the microscope, you see the classic acantholytic dyskeratosis. The classic form of this disease is derriase, although we see this less commonly than we see with Grover's disease, simply because that's a much more common disease. But you see the suprabasal or acantholysis with clefts in the epidermis, the so-called corones, acantholytic dyskeratotic spinous and granular cells, and grains, which are acantholytic dyskeratotic paracarototic cells. That is seen in 
any of these conditions. It's not specific for dairies. It's seen anytime you get acantholytic dyskeratosis, and this has negative immunopathology. So here you see corones and grains, acantholytic dyskeratosis, and this is seen with any of these diseases. So you're going to get a question about this. And I believe that there's actually been some genetic uh, information developed about the reason for this. I think it has to do with calcium transport. So that, that that's in there. They may ask you a question about the genotype, the genetics associated with acantholytic dyskeratosis as well. Paniculitis, uh, another one of the diseases. You probably get a few questions about this. Again, these are going to be, if you're going to get a biopsy on this, it's going to be a beautiful incisional large biopsy. It's not going to be a small shave or something like that. It's going to be classic. And you're probably, the, the biggest ones you're going to get asked questions about, probably going to be erythema nodosum, nodular vasculitis, lupus profundus, and possibly subcutaneous fat across the newborn. Erythema nodosum is a classic one. And the main thing here, in addition to knowing the histology, is know the clinical associations, sarcoidosis, deep fungal infections, et cetera, uh, inflammatory bowel disease associated with erythema nodosum. If you look at this under the microscope, it gives you the classic septal, mostly paniculitis with granulomatous inflammation. So this is at low magnification. This is a low magnification diagnosis, markedly thickened septa with granulomatous inflammation seen at the periphery of the septa and the lobules. And I would call that a so-called Meshur's radial granuloma. I, you know, we don't use that term anymore, but basically it's granulomatous septal, mostly paniculitis. A little bit of lobular involvement too, but it's mostly septal. And notice these multinucleated histiocytes here with some neutrophils and occasionally even some eosinophils in erythema nodosa. Pancreatic paniculitis, it's not actually a true paniculitis. It's a metabolic disease where you get circulating Abnormal, abnormal amylase and lipase, which causes dissolution of the fat. It turns the fat into soap, which then becomes an inflammatory reaction secondary to the degenerated fat. And the saponification of the fat is pathognomonic of pancreatic paniculitis. You can see these ghosts of lipocytes with calcification. So here you see those right here at high magnification. And notice the inflammation that's here. This is all secondary to the saponification. So normally, pancreatic paniculitis, no inflammation. You get lipase amylase, damages fat, secondary inflammation. So that's really how that develops. So I believe the last thing we're going to briefly talk about is alopecia. Again, uh, basically, if you have a good understanding of the way that we diagnose alopecia, it's really not that difficult. Um, basically, it's scarring, non-scarring, inflammatory, non-inflammatory. Look where the inflammation is, where the scar is located, where it's focal or diffuse, where it's tied to the follicle or, or between the follicles. And you really need to know the most common ones, lichen planus, discoid lupus, alopecia areata, trichotillomania. So those are the main ones. Know the hair shaft abnormalities. Don't worry about the bizarre things. AA, uh, classic clinical features. Early on, you'll see the perimobile infiltrative lymphocytes. One clue that can help you is synchronization of the cycle. All the follicles get shifted into catagen at the same time. Nothing else does that. Uh, if you see that, it's, it's alopecia areata, whether or not there's any inflammation. These are the exclamation point hairs. They might show you pictures of those. So notice that this is the hair follicle here where the, there was a little thinning of the hair shaft that broke and then it got thin and then it broke. And this is because the inflammation comes in here and it's kind of cyclical, if you will. So you get an inflammatory process, the hair shaft gets thin, it gets fi finally thin, and then it breaks off and leaves you this little exclamation point that you see here. So this is AA. Uh, notice the peribulbar infiltrate of lymphocytes down here. That's the classic pattern. So peribulbar lymphocytic infiltrate, think AA. And this is a transverse section. Again, notice all these follicles are at the same stage of evolution. They, they're all shifting towards catagen. They've all got these peribulbar infiltrates of lymphocytes. That's classic for alopecia areata. Like in Plano pilaris, the inflammation here likes the isthmus and the infundibulum of the follicle. So it kind of zooms in at that site. You get scarring around the infundibulum of the follicle. That's classic for that disease. If you see that, really that and frontal fibrosing alopecia and central centrifugal alopecia. Those are the three things that can give you that pattern. But pretty much if you see that, you should think about lichen planum pilaris. So notice this inflammation here is going right at this side here. It's not involving the bulbs down here. It's targeting this site. So it's targeting a different area of the follicle, gives scarring alopecia, wipes out the germinative isthmus 
of the follicle, the mantle zone, and the hair never grows back because the stem cells that are located up here get wiped out. As a consequence of that, they get turned into scar tissue. So this is lichen planopilaris. Um, you can do immunofluorescence. You can sometimes see some fibrinogen at the, at the uh, dermodermal junction in that case in some situations so that can help you. But you need to know also about discoid LE and the other few of those there. So just uh, a couple of quick questions to see if you learn anything here. 38-year-old woman comes with two years to recurrent red brown papules. Biopsy reveals large atypical CD30 positive T cells. What's the most likely diagnosis going to be here? This can be lymphomatoid papulosis. Okay, I didn't show you a slide of that, but I had mentioned that that's in the differential diagnosis. So CD30 positive, make sure you know that that's characteristic of lymphomatoid papulosis, especially if there's a papular eruption. Classic histology of pustular psoriasis. Uh, what are you going to see there? Histology and clinical. Well, you're going to see a situation where you get mounds of perikeratosis, acanthosis, and intraspinous neutrophils in pustular psoriasis. Middle-aged woman comes with a long-standing history of rosacea, hyperpigmented macular lesions on both ankles. What do you think about there? You see these brownish black granules. So again, these are, I didn't cover these in the lecture, but these are things that you need to know about. So, so look at these, these questions. So, you know, I needed to know the answer to these. Well, this is obviously going to be minocycline when you see these kind of blackish brown granules and macrophages is most commonly seen there. 10 year old kid, lifelong, linear. Okay, so it's been present since birth. Uh, yellow brown warty papules coalescing into a plaque on the neck. Biopsy shows papillomatosis, elongation re ridges, focal vacuolar alteration, spinous cell layer. What's the diagnosis going to be here? This is epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, which is one of the reaction patterns you can see in an epidermal nevus. Okay, again, we didn't cover that in this talk, but we talked about reaction patterns. So again, you need these are the kind of questions that you're going to need to know. And then the last one, again, possibly you might have learned this in this lecture, 45 year old complaints of hair loss, perifollicular scale, alopecia, lichenoid reaction of the basal cell layer, the follicular epithelium with an associated perifollicular infiltrative lymphocytes. What's the most likely diagnosis? Again, involving the infundibulum and the isthmus follicle. Hopefully this one you did know from the lecture like in planopilaris. Okay, so that's an overview of some inflammatory skin diseases, board immersion uh, type of uh, overview. It's not comprehensive. You need to know a lot more than that, but that's the kind of stuff that you're going to get on the board. So hopefully uh, it'll give you some guidance as you start studying, start preparing for the boards. It's obviously early days. You've got, you know, if you're a third year taking, you've got six or so months or more to learn this. Uh, hopefully you've already learned a lot but you need to uh, take this kind of stuff as a template and add to it and make sure you've got a good comprehensive knowledge of dermatopathology before you take that exam. All right, thank you so much for your attention and we will uh, perhaps next week or in another uh, future session go over the neoplastic portion of that lecture so you'll, you'll get an overview of neoplasmas as well.